You're listening to Slightly Sophisticated, where we have real conversations about real issues, although the levels of sophistication may vary. If you're tired of professional pundits on panels just regurgitating talking points or commentators monologuing from their soapbox, then you're in the right place. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Here's your host, Kyle Ramos. I suppose some of us are slightly sophisticated. Listen. Thank you everybody for listening. Today I am joined by Mark Sargent. He is a flat earther. And I thought it would be nice to change up the pace a little bit and get what get away from some more political stuff to talk about stuff that's just interesting. Mark, thank you for being here today. Hey, thanks very much for having me. So uh, just give everybody a background. I think would be interesting to start just a background of like how you started and how you got into it. Like what made you want to look into the flat earth idea or even think that it was a thing or how did that all happen? Uh, well, first, I, I didn't want to look into it. I thought it was awful, terrible, but a really, really silly thing to look into. Uh, but since I'm a little older, it was uh, on my bucket list of things to do, which is look at just about every conspiracy you could think of. Mm-hmm. And so I had an opinion on just about everything you could, uh, but I didn't on Flat Earth in 2014. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I should be able to knock this thing out. It's a piece of crap. And I stared at it in the summer of 2014 for a weekend, and there were a lot of little things about it that were bugging me. And so I just kept pulling on threads and pulling on threads until finally, uh, the beginning of 2015, February 10th, actually, I just gave up. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go the other way. And I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't asking my friends for help or any of the people I knew on the internet. Uh, I wasn't asking anybody for help. So I, just, I had made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues. And I put them on YouTube. It was basically my asking for help. It's like, okay, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. Not definitively, anyway. And show me where I went wrong. And thought that somebody, you know, somebody from academia would give me some sort of tongue lashing and, and shut this thing down and say, look, you can go, you forgot to carry the two and go back to your normal life. And that would be it. And the exact opposite happened to where, you know, I had people calling me from all walks of life. Um, all branches of the armed forces and engineers and pilots and air traffic controllers and so on and so on. People are saying, yeah, you know what? It's not that crazy. Here's why. And between that and, and all the other people that were interested in it just kept reinforcing itself to here we are five years later. So what did, and um, maybe you've talked about this before, but what have you, what did you do? Like, what were you looking at to, to say the earth is round and that you couldn't prove? Like anything specific? Well, yeah. When I was looking, when, when you try to prove the globe, and, and by the way, any, anyone who's in flat Earth, uh, you can always tell by the verbiage because we don't use the word round because round can be used for two dimensional things. Like your dinner plate is round, a pizza is round. Uh, mm-hmm. We use ball, globe, or sphere. You know, th- something something three dimensional. Mm-hmm. So when I was trying to prove the globe, one of the first things I was doing. Uh, was going to NASA imagery or any space imagery. It didn't have to be NASA. I mean, there's other space agencies now. And I find out that the first thing I looked at was there were no pictures of the Earth from space. Literally, there were there were none uh, when I was first looking at this. Meaning, I'll, I'll take you back to a, a quick story that happened to me back in 2000, which I should have caught on, but you know, back in 2000, I was just loving life and ignorant to everything. And what was what I was doing was I wanted to put different shots of the Earth from space onto different monitors. I was running a tech support team in uh, Boulder, Colorado, for this time that's uh, attended software company, and I wanted to put different images. You know, I thought yeah, there's iconic images out there. I might as well put them on. And I started doing these searches, uh, you know, 2000, 2001 for Earth from space and all the Boolean strings of Earth from space. And there were there was one. There was literally one image of the Earth from space, and we've all seen it. It's the Apollo 17 classic blue marble shot. And no matter what search string I put in, I only got the same image in just different resolutions and different tints. But it was obviously, you know, always the same image. And I, I, for the life of me, I was like, why is there only one image of the Earth from space in in 2000? You know, 2000, 2001. 
And I literally was like yelling at the computer going, NASA, you suck. I go, you got the worst internet presence ever. What I did not realize was, is that literally there was no image of the Earth from space. That was the, the first thing I looked at. In fact, when, um, if you, I think his name was Robert Simmons. I, I really got to memorize that name. Um, the first, if you remember, I don't know if you're where you were when the first iPhone came out. But you know, the first, the, literally the first iPhone had a, a picture of the Earth from space. And most mm -hmm. people don't know that it was absolutely photoshopped. It was absolutely built from scratch. And the reason it was built from scratch is that there were no photos of Earth from space when the first iPhone came out. Uh, the, the, again, his name, I'm pretty sure it was Robert Simmons. Um, he, he, in fact, he broke it down in this interview. It's like, oh, yeah, this is exactly how I built it. And I thought, wow, that's really, that, that was one of the first things that caught me. It's like 43 years. It, was, it wasn't until the summer of 2015 that the second blue marble shot was taken. And we know this only because Obama uh, was the one that announced it during a White House briefing. I've got the links to it in my description box. And Scott Kelly wrote the, um, the, the press release on it, supposedly from the space station. It's like, wow, 43 years, you never took another shot of the Earth from space, not a full disc shot. And that's where most people start, you know, their, their journey is like they start, you want to lean on NASA, you want to lean on the, the space programs, and there's nothing to lean on. You, you look at this, what you open it, it's like you open up this uh, storage facility and there's tons and tons of boxes inside, but they're all empty. It's just a few pieces of packing popcorn. So that was the first thing I looked at. Sorry, I ramble. No, no, that was good. Um, well, I would, I don't know, you know, I don't ha haven't done the research on that, so I have no idea. That's all right. Um, <laughs> but it, I, the only thing that I would say is I have seen um, like stuff, particularly, what's his name? Kelly? The twin, the twin brother that went up there, the ball, the ball yeah. guy, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, there was a documentary um, from when he was in space and that whole uh, you know project for him being up there for a year, yeah. And you know they have images like video, do they from like when he was in in space? You yeah. Know? Unfortunately, most of them are just CGI fantasy. And, I, and I'm not trying to be snarky or, or when I say that, but the when people say, uh, all right, let me, let me back up a little bit. Am I saying that everything that NASA puts out there is a lie? Not everything NASA does is a lie, but most of it. Uh, not, but that doesn't mean that everybody that works at NASA is in on it. 99% of everybody that works at NASA doesn't know anything. It's just compartmentalized. I mean, if you build a fuel system, you don't need to know anything. If you do HR, you don't need to do anything. If you polish capsules, you don't have to do anything. But it has to be faked. Uh, it, it, in fact, um, this the the whole flat earth thing justified a question which i was i was asking for a number of years because you know way before flat earth people were questioning the whole moon mission uh, even to the uh uh yeah, the, still do yeah. the what people still do oh yeah still do but they were doing this like back in the 70s way before the internet people were questioning this because the images just didn't match up uh to where there was this wonderful movie uh, in the late 70s called capricorn one that was done by a CBS studio exec. It wasn't that he didn't believe in the Apollo mission. It's he's going, the production value was terrible. He goes, it was some of the worst production value ever considering you know the, the technology that we had. And that's why he made Capricorn One, which was a fake Mars mission, which absolutely could be done. And if people think it's like, oh no, we can't fake it. And Neil deGrasse Tyson's like, oh no, it's way harder to fake it than it would be to do it in real life. I was going, have you not seen Gravity? The, the movie Gravity and not all the others. I mean, Gravity, which was done, you know, years years after like 2001 a space odyssey is beautiful absolutely gorgeous you could in fact if you took the scenes with bullock and clooney out of it and just intersplice some of those earth scenes and you and, and intersplice those with nasa cuts they would be identical so tell me what's real and what's not and 2001 a space odyssey which was done in 1968 you look at that in blu-ray now it's gorgeous it's absolutely gorgeous we absolutely can fake just about anything nowadays I mean, forget about Photoshop. Uh, that that Photoshop, of course, undermined the credibility of any image that was ever on the internet. Uh, but now we can do stuff in full motion video. So, sorry, uh, everything that NASA does, including, oh hell, I mean, I could I could send you a, a just a simple NASA image from Apollo 12, you know, any of the moon missions, because that's usually the first place you have to start, and that is when you're asking anybody about this, you have to say, okay, do you believe the Americans went to the moon? And if they say unequivocally yes 
then you're going to have to back up a little ways because that is a tough, tough pill to swallow for anybody, especially in the United States. You mm -hmm. know, if you if you live here, you know, rah, rah, go team, wave the flag. You know, you're, you're told it's like, in fact, there was a line, sorry, not to go off on a little tangent here, but there was a line by um, a newscaster at Fox News who said, who, she was she was going off on the whole you know people disputing Apollo and then the American space program and she goes and she literally said I'm not kidding quote I believe in Apollo because I'm a patriot it's like okay <laughs> that's all yeah. I need to hear there yeah well I don't right. I don't necessarily <laughs> I don't think it makes you a patriot because you believe something the government tells you uh, uh, well well that's just it I mean but that was her point is like you uh, know if you want to be a good American citizen you believe everything that the media tells you yeah. Well, another up. another reason that I have a hard time believing the conspiracy in in it is that there would have to be so many people involved, and like even to their civilians, um, for instance, Google. Google has Google Earth, right? They have right. Um, satellites that are in some form taking a picture of the Earth. Let's say that, mm. right? And you would think that there's just too many people, right? There's nobody at Google that's going to come out and say, yeah, like our or our satellites aren't orbiting a sphere, right? They're just in somewhere taking pictures. Like there's just so many people uh, that would have to be you, involved. And that's that's a good argument. Uh, and I've heard it many, many times. Uh, the two, two points I'd like to bring out. One I'll use, I'll just take straight up from Capricorn 1, which is the only people that have to be in on it. Remember, compartmentalized uh, in the military, need to know. You've heard the term need to know basis. Uh, you only tell the people that need to know when they absolutely it is, it is part of their mission. In Capricorn 1, only the telemetry guys needed to know, meaning uh, you get the guys that make the fuel systems, the guy that make the, the, that does all the most of the hardware. They don't need to know anything. The only guys that need to know it, really anything are when the rocket gets outside of visual range. And then you're just, you know, you're just viewing the rocket based on data. Whoever controls that data, it's like, oh, the rocket's here. You have no idea where it is. But whoever controls that data is the is the one that's uh, the one that takes care of it. But so your second point, which is, uh, you, you know, you, you're you're talking about a whistleblower. It's like, okay, you know, eventually you're going to have a whistleblower. Well, if the compartmentalization and the need to know is so small, so few people, you watch all those people. I mean, very very closely. Uh, you do. I'm, I'm speaking less if I was in the agency. Uh, you psychological profile just about everybody, all the astronauts. You make sure their emails are monitored, their phone calls are monitored. If they even think like they're going to deviate somewhere, you make sure they don't uh, in, in various ways. I mean, the, the Gus Grissom story from, from years ago. Plus, not, not, to, not to go in against the naive stuff here, but let's say you were, you were going to blow the whistle uh, to use a line from uh, the movie um, Three Days of the Condor. Who are you going to tell? Exactly. Who are you going to go to nowadays? Is any mainstream media outlet? I mean, you, you might be able to go to your friend at the local news station, but they, that's just an affiliate. It, when you know it goes up the food chain, all those food chains are monitored. Who do you tell? You know, if you go to the New York Times, if you go to you know CNN, who? How do you know that story is going to be run? Uh, if it was me, I would make sure all you know be, every story is monitored before it gets to that stage of whistleblowing. So sorry, I, I, there's no there's nobody you can go to. Uh, here's a quick one that I used in the clues, which was let's say you were just a pilot, for example. Let, let's forget about whistle blowing on a on a huge scale. Let's say you were a pilot and you thought the Earth may not be a globe. Right? You you may be living in some sort of building. If you're a pilot or a navigator or whatever for one of these one of these airlines, who 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 do you exactly go to in the airline? I mean, do you go to the FCC, you know, the, the sorry, not the FCC, uh, the, um, the Pilots Association? Do you go to your airline? Do you go, I'm sorry, FAA? Do, do you go to the FAA? No. I mean, you would be better off, uh, it, you would be safer if you told, went to your airline and said that a UFO had been chasing you for two hours. Because you do that, you're benched forever. And to go in and say that, I, we've talked to pilots. I, I, there's a pilot um, at KLM Airlines who who said, oh, yeah, I absolutely think it's, it's um uh, you're li we're living in an enclosed structure. And she was benched. And they said, you will not go up in a plane again until you renounce what you just said. So, so you think that we're living in an enclosed structure? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. We're not living. And I know the pictures there that you see online. You know, it's this flat asteroid flying through space. No, no, it's way worse than that. You're living in a building. Uh, a structure of walls and a floor and a ceiling and something that was so huge that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out because we didn't have the tech to figure it out up until about 1960. Literally, we had we had no way of figuring out where exactly we were until 1960, which is about the same time that NASA was founded. And they were founded in 1958. And when they found out, again, because we had nothing to do with the building of this place, all they had to do was keep it a secret, which they did very, very well. Uh, they, the, the two things you would do is you would seal off the outer edge and the upper edge, which they did simultaneously. Uh, in 1959, they created the Antarctic Treaty, which is the only unbreakable treaty in the history of mankind, which says that no corporations can set up shop there from any country ever. It can only be military and military scientists. Uh, tourists can visit the outer peninsula, but that's about it. Uh, if you want to say that you took a sled dog or whatever, you know, drug a sled to the uh, the South Pole, no. Uh, and and by the way, there's so many countries that are involved with any sort of exploration of Antarctica. It's amazing. Nobody owns Antarctica. That's just the Antarctic. The other part is militarizing space, the upper edge. 1959, the outer edge was sealed off with the Antarctic Treaty. And 1959, uh, the Van Allen radiation belts were announced by NASA, which was founded in 1958. And basically said that, oh, yeah, it's super, super dangerous. You can't go up there ever. You'll die. Even though the moon missions went round trips through it in the 60s with no problem whatsoever, which was interesting. All military. The five, in fact, the 500 people that have ever even claimed to have gone to space have been all military, with the exception of the, uh, the civilian group from the 1986 uh, uh, Challenger disaster. Well, so... <clears throat> who then then who exactly could have built such a structure dun 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 that's the big question isn't it or one of the big questions and that is uh, yeah uh well you can really only go one of two ways uh one is science fiction and one is sort of spiritual so you can go to the science fiction side you you know this one very well uh, which is because we've covered it in mo multiple movies which is that it's a um uh, an older and more, much more powerful civilization than ourselves that has engineering abilities that are far beyond what we can do. Or it's the divine, which is just an, uh, an entity that also has technology that's far beyond ours. And really, at that point, you're, you're kind of splitting hairs. I mean, one man's uh, old ancient civilization is another man's deity. I mean, let's face it, if a giant golden spaceship all of a sudden landed in some country, uh, there'd be some people would say, oh, wow, they do look like the things from Avatar. And there'd be, at the same time, there'd be churches that would automatically pop up because of these groups. Um, but as far as who built it, I, the question of why, you know, I mean, we're talking about theological questions at, at that stage because mm -hmm. it's much bigger than ourselves. But think of, think of this. Because engineering to us, you know, we think of what we've done in the last hundred years. We've made incredible leaps in, in technology. I mean, whoa, 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 we have to 8K television? I'm not even sure now anymore. What if we could make a million K television? Mm -hmm. What could you do with that? Uh, and things that we can do now, like, you know, say, well, it's still too big. And it's like, no, I mean, to the ant farm, we can make a, a million dollar ant farm. That would be amazing, right? And to the ants, it would be the closest thing to God ever. Uh, but to us, it'd be like, well, just a million dollar ant farm. Uh, what's the difference? I don't know. It's interesting that that mm. it's a possibility. But mm. so here's the thing. This is another thing that I have a hard time with. Then, yeah. and maybe you've gone through this. So I'm not sure. But how do you explain the fact that the sun rises at least? I don't know if you want to call it east or west, but you know, for I guess for argument's sake, rises on the east, sets yeah. in the west. As far as just just like the, just this is the path it takes. Yeah. Um, well, okay, first off, uh, we have to back up a little bit. One, if we are in an enclosed structure, then the sun and the moon are likely inside here with us, and they're very, very small. Uh, and, in fact, they're almost the same size. Uh, so the sun would be, and I know the maps, the, the, the artist illustrations that we draw are out of scale because, unfortunately, the sun is so small in our models that you can't even really see it as far as it's, it'd be about a pixel wide. Whereas most of the diagrams, you see these, these big herking things above the, uh, the sun and the moon or the, above the, the disk. 
but th we have to draw them like a thousand miles wide just so people could see them. But if the sun was, let's say, 50 miles wide, uh, it's just going around o over the top of this thing like uh, a mobile above a child's crib. That's, that's all it's really doing. And it's not setting, it's just going off into the distance. And the combination of it being really, really small and the atmosphere has a thickness to it. Again, we don't teach people, uh, including myself, uh, physics or engineering or chemistry. You know, the, what we're breathing in right now is just kind of a thin version of water. It's not even, you know, people say, oh, well, it's transparent. You can't see it, but it's like, well, okay, well, you're breathing in some oxygen, but it's mostly nitrogen. You know, it's 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen. I know there's some trace gases, but let's, we won't care about yeah. that. Let's make it easy. But that means there's a thickness to it. And over, uh, you know, when it goes, things go off into the distance, they just get fogged out. It's like a thin version of fog. So if it's a ship, you'll see the ship like, you know, disappearing, but you'll see it like floating off the water for, for no apparent reason. Same thing when you're looking down a hot road. You know, why does the jogger's legs all of a sudden disappear, even though he's only going down that road 500 yards? Um, with the sun, because it's so bright, it'll still go through that atmosphere and you'll seize this atmospheric lensing, which is why it won't look perfectly spherical. It'll get kind of squished, which doesn't make any sense, you know, but it, but yeah, that's that's the only reason. Well, I, I know <clears throat> you were talking about most of the path, but I, I had to throw in the... Yeah, uh, no, I understand that. I, I completely understand that whole concept. Um, yeah. But like because i've seen i was looking at the models and it's so like i'm drawing here it's like a, a big round disc right yep. that would encompass you know what we know is earth yep. right and then above it would like also have a smaller in diameter arm that would house a sun and a moon on either side yep. right and then that would spin like inside so it's not quite as big it spins inside but to me, that would make it so like the path of the sun, like if I was looking up, it would it would it would have to, you know, like turn around me, you know, so it would show up and then it would I'd see it, you know, and then it would then it would leave. But it would it wouldn't it wouldn't go up and down. It would go like around. Well, because we're so cl if the sun is really, really close and really really small you're still going to get that effect it's it's not going to it would go it, you're absolutely right it would go around you if you were say at during the arctic circle during that 24 hour sun at the arctic near the arctic circle and we've got videos we've got some of our people that were up there absolutely you will see it just going around and around which which is what you would expect even if it was a globe model you would mm -hmm. expect that um but when you get you know towards the outer edges now it would just go across the sky i mean it would go it would literally go from one side to the other but in fact, I just sent you a couple of videos and there's some wonderful videos out there where people say, well, wouldn't you see it like like getting bigger and big, getting smaller when it got off the horizon? And yes, we do. Most of the time it's in drier climates, but that just goes to our point, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you see the effect of atmospheric lensing. This place was designed for the illusion of that. It is brilliant in, in that aspect. Again, no different than a, a giant version of the Truman Show. Uh, let me ask you this. So yeah. if... How, about how many flat earthers are there? Do you know? Oh, good lord! I don't know. A lot Millions. of them. Oh yeah, so, a lot. I mean, there was there was. L let me give you a quick quick story, real quick. <laughs> that was redundant. The uh, uh, the U.gov uh, British Research Group wasn't ours. You know, it was uh, it was uh, mainstream science. They were curious. So in 2017, they did a video or they did a, a an article where they they polled 10,000 Americans. And they said, what, what do you think about flat earth? Blah, 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 you know, different answers. And what's interesting was as they got younger and younger, the, the numbers went up and up. And to where when they got to the lowest group, which was 18 to 24 year olds, it was skewing a full third against the globe. And that really freaked them out. That was when all the science journals started getting in. I mean, they were even getting criticism. It's like, well, you're doing it wrong. You're obviously polling. It's like, what are you talking about? They're a, they're a polling group. That's all they do is poll. And that shouldn't surprise anybody. So, in fact, when you go under 18, which you're not even legally supposed to talk to from a, from a polling standpoint, it skews even higher. Again, shouldn't really, that shouldn't really surprise anyone because people are more pliable when they're younger. So, anyway, sorry. Short answer, millions. Yeah, yeah. No, so, well, this is the only thing. This is what, because I think that it would be an easy hypothesis to prove, like, definitively Right. If you got a group of people 
yeah. and you pull t- this is the point I was making if you pull together some money and I think a plane might be a little more difficult because you have to get fuel it might be a fuel issue and you know distance yeah. or whatever but a boat seems very plausible right you get a boat big fuel capacity and yeah. you would just go like from the California coast or from uh, some kind of a coast yeah and then just drive due east or west and then if you would either run into another landmass, yeah, which would be like a, and then you could go around that, you know, presumably you could just go around it and then keep going in one yeah. direction. And eventually you would either just keep hitting landmasses and get back to where you started or. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Gal. The edge. Yeah. The, um, is it, am I thinking Galileo? Yeah. Galileo. The Galileo thing, which is if you take off in one direction, would you, if you're on a globe, wouldn't you come back, arrive in the same spot? I, I know, you know, where he where he circumnavigated the globe. Uh, the, it's an old argument, which is it's like, well, it doesn't really affect us much because if we're on, let's say, just a dinner plate, we'll use that as an example. If you take your finger and you move it in a big circle around the dinner plate and you come back in the same spot, technically you've circumnavigated the dinner plate. Does it make it a globe? No, no, it just means you circumnavigated. Uh, now, some people would come back and say, well, yeah, but in that case, you're making this really, really wide you know, left-hand turn or, or a wide right-hand turn. It's like, yeah, but if the, ans- you know, if, if the distances are so huge, you're never, ever, ever going to notice it. Plus, don't forget that you're using GPS to guide you in most cases. Well, you could do and- it. I, I think you could do it without GPS. If, if you believe, I mean, I don't know. Do you believe that there is a north and, and that a compass uh, and like just a oh, rudimentary, compass, the, a rudimentary yeah, yeah, com- compass works. Oh yeah, the compass absolutely still works. In fact, that's that's a great point you brought up. So then you is, could just use a compass and just keep going west or east from. Yeah, com- compass doesn't compass works though on a flat world as well. Clump- compass north in on a flat world is just the center. In fact, <laughs> in fact, it's interesting because north there is no there is no magnetic south. Which blows, but most people don't even know that. Uh, you know, supposedly, remember, it's it's a dual pole system, North Pole, South Pole, right? And yeah. but we've had people, you know, in Antarctica, you know, not us, not our people, you know, science scientists that go, hey, what does a compass do in the su- South Pole? And they said, no, nothing. For, for whatever reason, it doesn't do anything. Compass acts really, really weird, which is what we would expect. So uh, it, all you have is the North. All you have is magnetic North, which of course moves a little bit, but. But magnetic north works perfectly fine for us because if you use the compass, you bypass GPS, whatever, and said, "Oh, hey, make sure north is is this way." Oh, you can still circumnavigate, no problem, whatsoever. What's more interesting though is that there's no south. I and I've talked to multiple people, including military guys, is going, "Yeah, nobody talks about it that there is no magnetic south." You'd think when you got below the equator, eventually that compass is going to dominate south, you know, mm-hmm. because a stronger magnetic force would would be with you when you were south. It goes never ever happens. It's always north. Yeah, but but I I think my my theory would still be provable because you could just go if you believe north is is north and there's just in the center. Yeah. Um, then you could just go north until you got to the furthest north, and then keep going past it, and then presumably you'd be going south. Um. Yeah. But, but that you, doesn't necessarily it doesn't prove make that doesn't make it a globe. It just means that you've gone past the magnetic north. Yeah, but I'm saying then you just come back to it. You can just go back to it. Oh, oh, I see what you're getting. Oh, okay. Like well, if no, there's, that's, a, if that's there's, a whole other, that's a whole other point. Some which is, point that is 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 some directional um, center, and right. you left from that center, and yep. using the the magnets of the pole, I guess. And if well, you if you I, believe I, that, then yeah. you, if, you could either hit a wall somewhere. Right. Or you'd be able to, to, to come all the way back to, to, to it. To come around the other side. No, what you're talking about is the uh, the pole-to-pole circumnavigation, which is, has has anybody gone North Pole to South Pole and gone back? Gone back? No, they haven't, which is very, very interesting. Almost uh, every, every circumnavigation you've ever heard of goes around, you know, the equator side. No one goes the, the, the longitude way. They mm-hmm. always go latitude which I find just absolutely fascinating. Nobody, even planes, don't do it, uh, which is a whole other thing. Planes are forbidden from flying across Antarctica, uh, even though it's the shortest route in many, many different things. And Wikipedia says, well, it's just too cold. It's like, what are you talking about too cold? It's like negative 30 degrees when you get up at you know 30,000 feet. So mm-hmm. how, how can it be too cold? No, I get it. No, and that's a great, that would be a great test. 
to if you were going from but there's there's easier ways if you want to prove because eventually you're going to get to this it's like how would you prove uh, the globe to me you know how, how would you do it there's two ways you could do it uh one the easy way well i shouldn't say the easy way uh, the more expensive way but still easier would be take any sort of camera hopefully 4k put it on the capsule of any rocket that's going to leave earth and then point it down that's it. Just point it at the launch pad and turn it on and let the rocket go up. And eventually the Earth is going to, you know, you're going to see things, the you know, landmass gets smaller and smaller because eventually it's going to curve into a globe. It's going to leave. It should have happened with SpaceX when that Tesla in space went to Mars, supposedly. It never, in fact, it's never happened in the history of space travel ever, which is statistically highly unlikely that there, you would have no rocket, you know, pointing the thing down and it would just just never, ever just run and turn into a globe. That'd be the, uh, the easiest way to do it nowadays. Um, one of the other things you could do, though, if you wanted to do it on the ground for cheap, and it was something I came up with a couple of years ago, which is the um, uh, the spacesuit challenge, which is the thermal dynamics says that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure. Which is why you know you blow up a balloon you let it go with your finger it's gonna always fly off always 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 um a vacuum chamber you can't have a vacuum next to a non-vacuum without a barrier or pressure next to non-pressure i mean that's why balloons pop mm -hmm. and stuff like that so but there's only there's there is something in the history of thermodynamics the history of physics that defies this for some reason that's the spacesuit when you pump air into a basketball it becomes a basketball and it's tight. You can't do anything with it. You know, if you've ever played basketball, it's super tight. You can't burst mm -hmm. it. You can't, I mean, I suppose if you're really strong, you could. Uh, but why doesn't a spacesuit become a basketball? Why doesn't a spacesuit become a parade float? It, it, it's perfectly flexible. It's like there's no pressure difference at all between the spacesuit and what's outside the spacesuit, which is a vacuum. And people say, oh, it's layers. And go, no, no, my winter coat has layers. All it does is stop the cold from getting in how does a spacesuit work in fact how did nasa and you can the movies aren't secret you can watch this nasa when they were in the late 50s early 60s when they were designing their first spacesuits they were all plastic and metal because they knew what physics were it's like yeah there's a vacuum out there we can't have we can't use a flexible suit and then somewhere along the line they said, let's just go for a flexible suit nobody knows anything about physics we'll just do it and people will absolutely buy it along with the other stuff like no stars and uh vhf transmitter that shouldn't do that no blast crater and all this other stuff and, and that works. So my challenge is give me, loan me, I don't want it, give me any spacesuit from the 1960s because they all work flawlessly from the 1960s until now, put me in a vacuum chamber and pull the switch. Tell me, tell me what happens. Tell me how I don't die. Tell me how that works. And it, it, the people don't understand how powerful, which segues into another thing I got to bring up real quick, which is Hold on real quick. I want to ask you. So you yeah. would be willing with your presumption that that is not effective and that it's, it's false. Yep. That to would die. Be, it would be suicide. Yep. It would be. And to martyr for the cause. Oh, God, yes. That'd be a romantic little thing. I'm one of those guys that would die for a cause if mm -hmm. it's uh, if it meant it. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. The what? I just wanted to clarify that. Oh, yeah. No, I absolutely would. I, mean, I put it out there. I said, look, put, because because I know full well that the only now of course part of my challenge is like you might want to get another space suit put a scientist in there with me you know just to just to ante up because if i'm gonna die you, you know i might want to might be better if somebody else keeled over you know with me but it but it goes along the premise of the uh the, one of the one of the biggest points next to long distance photography which is our number one point of all time which we might get into later uh but the second biggest one is gravity versus the vacuum of space and what wins, gravity or a vacuum? And the vacuum will win every single time. I mean, we've all seen the little things from anywhere from taking a household vacuum cleaner that can pick up a bowling ball to you sucking a soda out of the bottom of a glass with a straw. Well, why, why does that happen? Because you use the, the force of a vacuum to, to pull that, you know, why didn't the gravity keep that soda in the glass? Well, because your, your mouth was stronger. Well, it means, you know, it doesn't take much to do it. And so I extrapolated that out and I say, okay, let's say there's a second floor to your place where it is right now. And you turn that second floor into a vacuum chamber, not even a very big one, just, you know, just a medium sized vacuum chamber, put a valve, you pop that valve. What happens? It's not like the movies. It's absolutely instant. It's absolutely violent. And they will equalize in, in a fraction of a second. And 
sit and, and you say, what's the point? I say, well, why didn't gravity keep the air in your room instead of going upstairs? And they say, well, because the vacuum chamber it was too powerful. I go, that's my point. When you go outside, why is our atmosphere still here? And your initially your knee jerk response is going to be, well, because of gravity. And it's like, you mean the exact same gravity that couldn't even keep the air in your room just five seconds ago? Is and I've literally had people come back and me say, well, there, there's more gravity outside. It's like, no, it's the same gravity. So and and scientists will never they they don't have an answer for this. Are that you is saying where, are you saying like if they were like are. You, I just want to clarify. You're saying yep. that we have, there, there's the atmosphere around Earth, and yep. when, when a rocket punctures that to go to space, yeah. theoretically, the vacuum of space should. Im oh yeah, and that's that's the best. Yeah, that's the best case scenario. What you're talking about there, which you use the word nobody else has used that word in anything I've ever done. Punctured, because mainstream science will never tell you where exact where does our atmosphere end and space begin. Where is the bleeding edge of space? Because that bleeding edge of space defies physics. Meaning you can't have, it, it's not like air, 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 vacuum. It, that's not how it works. Every, you know, it, and, and gravity will lose every single time. And no one, no one will touch it. They won't touch it with a 10 foot ball. And it's, again, I don't blame people because it's something we don't focus. I mean, how many people really focus on physics in high school? Not me. I hated mm -hmm. that stuff. Well, another thing that bothers me is that when I was a kid, I had a, a telescope. Yeah. And you could see, um, it was a pretty decent telescope. So you yeah. could see like craters on the moon. Um, yeah. You could see planets. Like I had a little, you know, I had one of those little maps that told you like where the planets are at, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm assuming you don't think that's true, but like you could see things with a telescope and we have some pretty good telescopes. And that was like just one that my parents bought me for Christmas or whatever, you know? Sure. It wasn't uh, anything, you know? expensive yeah. so how do you explain that like and and those are obviously like you could see that the moon at a distance is is a is a sphere I'm, oh I'm sure sure sure, sure 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 in fact and and the argument i and i know i'm dating myself when i say this if you go to a planetarium with a pair of binoculars and you look at the moon i mean we can do lots of things in the planetarium we can't do a sun yet i suppose if we spent the money we probably could we got the tech for it nowadays but it's really expensive um but you look at the moon with a pair of binoculars does it look spherical? Yes, it does. Does it look detailed? Well, depending on where you are, yes, it does. Can you land on it? No. Why not? Well, because it's just an image on the ceiling. It's just a three-dimensional image sitting up there. And I say, okay, who's to say when you don't walk out of that planetarium, you're just not walking into a much, much bigger planetarium. Uh, if, if the technology is available to someone outside of our civilization, you absolutely can fool people. I mean, the Truman Show in its... in in at least that limited aspect from 1998 was very very possible and that is we believe that the world is that is presented to us mm -hmm. if you were born into that system you're going to believe it uh we believe all sorts of things when when we're growing up. i mean for god's sakes many of us believed in santa claus until someone in the playground said that there wasn't a santa claus mm -hmm. uh but what if that kept going i mean you couldn't there are so what I'm saying is everything that's up there on the ceiling. You're just looking at a giant, very ornate, very detailed clock system that predates language. I mean, you know, it's it's just lights in the sky, the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon is just part of a giant clock system. So it's there. People oh, it's are, real. People are actually seeing it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's it's. But, it's but just again, it, just because you can the... see it doesn't mean that you can touch it. I mean, come on, we, we know that. Remember, and I know it's you're not probably not old like enough that. to remember when the um, when people switched over from non-HD to HD television. There was a lot of people that were blown away by the, by the clarity. It was like, yeah. wow. Again, we, they all said the same thing. It's like, wow, it's like you can reach out and touch it. They, like it's real, you know, to the point where like newscasters had to put on more makeup because you know we could we could see the flaws and they were that they were that detailed and that's just us remember we even we even have had hd tv for what 20 years maybe what what could you do if our civilization uh provided we weren't going to crash and burn in some sort of apocalypse uh what if we went on another thousand years what could we do and what if we were a benevolent society what could we build hmm. no i mean I just think that the the it, it could be disproven a little more easily, um, particularly with like the uh, circumventing the Earth. 
Circumnavigating? Yeah, circumnavigating yeah, Earth. If, again, if you could do a pull... Okay, I'll give you a quick one. Um, there was a... Well, fact, hold we on, let me ask you. But what, what is stopping from doing from North Pole to... Pole to pole? Pole to pole like that. Uh, first is money. Second would be the permitting. Uh, in fact, we, we were very interested. There was, I think it was two and a half years ago, there was a company that wasn't us that wanted to do a, a pole to pole circumnavigation and they were charging some along the lines of 10,000 a ticket to, to do it. And we like even a, a plane was going to do it and they were going to charge $10,000 per, per passenger per person. Yeah. 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 It was uh, somebody was going to pay, somebody was gonna pay $10,000. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, there was a lot of people that were going to, well, it's one of those exclusive a lot of money. things. Eh, rich people do dumb things. Yeah. It's obvious. But, they uh but they were charging it was a big jet too it was like a i, I don't know if it was a triple seven or a seven four seven but it was a big jet you know obviously because yeah. it had to have the fuel capacity and they were selling no tickets and we, in fact we there was a debunker one of our debunkers bought literally bought the ticket and did a crowdfunding thing and bought the ticket and three weeks before that thing was going to take off the website just disappears i mean not not closed not oh sorry we're refunding the money just gone we mm -hmm. don't know if it was a scam. We don't know if it was shut down deliberately. We don't know if some government group got involved and said, yeah, you can't even think about doing this and we're not going to tell you why. Uh, circumnavi pull to pull circumnavigation, yeah, sure, would be great. But don't forget that you would still, if you were going to do that, you still have to find a pilot that's willing to um, do it without GPS. Because, you know, do it with just, in, just compass instrumentation, which would be tricky from what I understand when you got to the South Pole. Um, because the GPS system is the United States mm. military. It was designed yeah. in the, the mid nineties. It's supposedly this blanket multi-satellite system, even though there's huge gaps in the coverage and, uh, sorry, you know, you can't not to use a line from the matrix, but the system is going to, you know, show you exactly what it wants to show you and steer you in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I want to ask you about, I forget the name of the documentary because I just watched it. It's when I reached out to you behind the curve. Yes. That one. Yep. And and the, the last <laughs> scene, I'm sure you're what. So oh, before I get yeah. to that, before I get to that, were yeah. you satisfied with the portrayal in that documentary? I wasn't initially, even though I was there for most of the seven months of shooting that, that they did, um, and I had nothing to do with the production of it. Uh, it was all, you know, it was an independent L LA film team that was curious, and it just kept snowballing into something that they thought they could eventually sell, but they didn't know how, how popular it was going to become. Um, it did well enough that when I went out to the, the film festivals to watch it, you know, I went to the premiere in Toronto and, and different other places around the country and it did a whole bunch of showings. I don't know how many countries it, it showed in, but it was a lot, um, before it was bought by Netflix. And I, my first impulse, I told everybody, I said, I said, flat earth community is going to hate it, which they did. And the rest of the world is going to think it's very interesting, which they did. Would I the the follow up question though is would I have changed anything? Uh, yeah, I probably would have changed the ending, even though the ending played well with the audiences because the the whole movie made people feel safe. Um, if you kind of treat it like drugs, it wasn't one hundred percent definitely wasn't one hundred percent uncut flat Earth. It was flat Earth for a while, then a scientist, flat Earth for a while, then a psychiatrist, flat Earth for a while, then an astronaut, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So when it got to the end which was a uh, Jaron from Jaronism uh, doing his laser test. A couple things. First off, you got to remember by the time we got to the end and we didn't even know, I didn't know. And I spent a lot of time with these guys. Um, the, the, the filmmakers hated flat earth, just hated it because they would thought we were, it, we were influencing kids, which I thought was interesting. You know, that was the, and that was the reason why they, they tore into us. Now, to their defense, did Jaron screw up that experiment? Yes, he did. Uh, most people, by the time they even got to that, you know, because that was literally the end of the film, uh, most people didn't even understand. I asked audience, audience members all the time, you know, and I said, do you understand what happened? And they said, something bad, right? That, I heard that all the time. It's like, something bad. And I go, how do you know something bad? It's like, well, it, it seemed like something bad. I go, do you even know what the experiment was? It's like, no, but we're pretty sure that it ended on a pro-globe note. And what people don't know is that Jaron, uh, when he did that experiment, didn't actually do line of sight tests before he even did the test. Meaning, 
it's the one of the rules of entertainment it's like don't do the first take live ever 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 go out there and make sure you know what you're doing before you actually do it don't all of a sudden bring a film team it's like oh yeah. we'll just wing it so they did it the first time people, people don't hold, hold also on didn't. so uh, i, I want to get into it but r first yeah. i want to real quick so i think that they the the film did a pretty good job in giving a little bit of both sides I think yeah. they were smart in picking you as the more of the center for the flat earth people because there was the other young guy from Texas who was off his rocker. Um, Nathan. <laughs> yeah, off his rocker. Yeah. And um, there was a couple other, you know, there's some people. And the, the other guy that ends up hating you, I guess, I don't know what his name is. Oh, Matt Boylan. Yeah. yeah he was obviously, I, like, there's obviously, they have some kind of, I'm no doctor, but it seems like they have some psychi some you know, psychiatric psychiatric issues. issues. And yeah, um, so yeah. they didn't pick somebody like that, which, right, they could have obviously made it look really bad. Yeah. And then, um, so I think that was, I think it was pretty good. It definitely got me thinking more, for sure. I, I, a, a lot of people, that was, that was yeah. it. I mean, my email load, like, doubled as soon as that thing came out on Netflix. Uh, and I didn't realize that everybody under the age of 30 because you get most bang for your buck have netflix mm -hmm. I, I was amazed yeah. um oh so anyway so about, about that the experiment i, I just oh, want yeah. to set it up so people understand what we're talking about they haven't oh, seen okay it. so what happened was the the whole experiment was a laser line of sight test so kind of like long distance photography lasers fire off perfectly straight so if there is a curvature of the earth uh you're shooting if you're shooting over a series of miles the laser will be um will should either if it's if it's a flat it should hit the target if it's not flat it should go above the target and what jaron had done was again we learn as we go along he had picked a, a section of ground in california that he thought was flat because based on what google earth said he's like oh google earth has he saw this section near a canal and he just but he never went out there to to check it he just went out there at night with the film team and never actually check to see if it was absolutely flat and because he's like well it looks kind of flat it's like it's not even a, a paved road it's like but he didn't know that and we didn't we didn't know what he had done until months later because he was getting so much grief after the documentary <laughs> that all of a sudden I, I see the podcast where he goes out there he's going and he, during the middle of the day he's going oh wow look at that he goes i don't even have line of sight it's like what were you doing <laughs> it's like you filmed this for the documentary twice and you never actually you know you actually shot it so the, the the test was was botched from the beginning and to and but to defend jaron there were so many other tests that we had done during the year with the doc and the documentary team knew full well about a uh, full well like we did a 40 kilometer uh laser test over lake balaton in hungary we sent a team over there with a with a military grade lasers very very cold we did it over near frozen lake you know for better conditions we don't want to fire through heat waves or you want you want to don't want to fire over a warm body of water if you can you want to make sure the distortions as low as possible and we did it against book world's record was there with us and we shot 40 kilometers it was great you know full detailed workup on the whole thing it was fantastic and we in fact after we, we became more and more refined to where you didn't even need lasers. We could do it during the daytime with mirrors, which was even better. We could actually take a mirror on the beach, literally at beach level, you know, like three feet off the water, and we could use the sun as a, basically a, a poor man's laser and fire it back at the camera. And we could shoot that at 10, 12, 15 miles. And so we had all those tests in the book, and the documentary team wouldn't, wouldn't look at them. They would not look at them. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give you one more quick one, which is, uh, you remember the, the first blue marble shot I was talking about for the iPhone, mm -hmm. right? Which was made by, by Robert Simmons. And it was, uh, you know, it was completely Photoshopped. And he was telling, and in fact, he used, overused the cloning tool in the su Southern Hemisphere because, I don't know, he had a happy hour to go to before he finished. I don't know why. I thought it would have been a pretty high profile thing for iPhone. But what was interesting was when Patricia and I, in that documentary, went to the Kennedy Space Center, they had that picture because it was a NASA engineer. So technically, they owned the rights to it. And they literally had that on the wall inside a space shuttle model that was outside. And we pointed this out to the, the documentary film lawyers, like, look, this is, you know, this is an absolutely fabricated image. Here's why. Here's the cloning tool. We showed them exactly why the image was there. And they, they never ran it. You know, we pointed out so many things to them. And they they wouldn't do it so the power of editing but to to be again to be fair I, would i have changed much no because i saw what the audience reaction was you know if we would have turned it into even after 
even though it was a, you know, uh, you know, flat earth, non flat earth, flat earth, non flat earth, you know, back and forth during mm -hmm. the movie. When the directors and the producers went up on stage to talk to the audience during the film festivals, almost the first question that came out of the audience members was, are you a flat earther? Are you guys flat earthers? And none of them were. But that was the first question, because if it was if they had said yes, then the audience wouldn't have taken them seriously. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, OK, well, it's a propaganda piece and you guys are just some sort of religious cult. Mm -hmm. And that would have been the end of it. So what well, I think to do it to do a, a, a proper documentary. You have to put opposing views because if yes. not, people are going to say this to that. They're going to say, oh, well, it's a, you know, just a biased, you know, yeah. Yeah. propaganda film. Yeah. So, and, and in fact, uh, there was most of the people, again, I sat in audiences and I watched it happen, um, where the first 20, 30 minutes of the film, people went in not even believing that it was real, thinking it was like a, a piece of docufiction where they literally did not think it was like, oh, you know, they... They, they they literally and then all of a sudden they they had this click moment where all of a sudden you you saw them whispering to each other going wait a minute there's something really big and scary on the internet and i know nothing about it and the, I'll, I'll give you another one which is there was a, an editor down in los angeles where the because a lot of people in la know each other when it comes to mm -hmm. this and they showed him a cut of the film he knew nothing about it they said just watch it we're not going to give you any context at all and when it was done the he um he came back. He goes, wow, you guys are holding out on me. He's like, why? He's like, he goes, where did you get the budget for this movie? And, and they're going, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, those actors, they played it absolutely straight. And because he didn't think that anybody was real. He literally thought that everyone was actors playing a role. They go, no, man, that was real. He goes, I mean, that conference happened? <laughs> because that was a real, he, goes, he, he thought that was like a multi-million dollar, you a know, bunch fake, of extras. Con fake <laughs> conference. And which would have taken multi-million dollars to, to fix something like that with, with the amount of actors that, that would have been in it. And it's like, no, they were there for days. And so, no, it was, yeah. It, so I, I liked the reaction of it and it generated a huge amount of interest. And you know, would I have changed a few things? Of course I would have. Mm -hmm. But not as many as I initially thought I would because of the, the interest it generated. Is this all you do is do the flat earth or do you have a, a, like a full? Like a, a, uh, this is what I do now. I didn't want to do this. I, I, are you kidding? <laughs> you think well, I really I, want? I just, I don't. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't. It, it, I don't know how you. What, like, how do you make money? Uh, YouTube? bits, bits and pieces mostly. So I make a little money off of Google, you know, because they pay me for YouTube hits, obviously. Um, two books: uh, Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's Limit, Flat Earth Clues, End of the World, uh, and. A uh, little money off the the podcast I do on True Frequency Radio, and then I've, I've done a few other things. Heck, I did I did a um a commercial last year in Australia <laughs> for a mobile phone thing, where they flew me down, and they they was called the 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 uh, the campaign was called Foolproof, and the thought was, well, if Mark can understand our app and he's a flat earther, then anybody can understand it. <laughs> and it's like, and but I got to say, and, and yeah, it was a little jab, but at the same time, I got the gig because there were flat earthers that work for that company that uh. I didn't, you know, find out until till later. So yeah, I didn't. Again, I didn't want to do this. This was this was definitely not something. It just kind of picked me up. I wasn't lying in the movie where he said it just kind of picked me up and took me along and and won't stop. I mean, here we are in the middle of lockdown, and I've still got. Uh, you, with the exception of the public appearances, what you know, I don't get to go. Like last year, I did. I don't know how many conferences I did, but it was like seven different countries. I did things in no last shit. year. Uh, we do hundreds of regional meetups, most of which I don't have to go to because they're scattered all over the place. Uh, but yeah, that's if I'm if I'm not doing interviews or doing podcasts or doing doing whatever. I mean that yeah, I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, because I mean, you're like a, when, when I watch the documentary and at the conference, you're like a rock star, like in that <laughs> in, in the flat Earth community. I, I I well, I don't know if rock star is the right word. I mean, yeah, what I what I like to say is I'm. We didn't talk about it in the movie that much, but I'm I'm the recruiter for the for flat Earth. So chances are, here's the difference: there have the people done better work than than me. Oh yeah, God yes, tons of them. Lots of people have done better work than me. Uh, but if if you're looking for the 101 book, chances are if you get into flat Earth, you are going to run into my stuff first, and and then you'll know me. And so it's kind of like that that um, 
you know, if you've known people at universities, academics, that's like, oh, yeah, I read such and such during my first year. But now I'm into I'm now I'm into these guys. That's I get that a lot. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I was into your stuff. I hear that a lot. It's like, it was it's like, OK, yeah. so they yeah, they know who I am. And and uh, but again, it's it is a little weird because I've only been doing this and I'm one of the oldest guys in this. Well, not not physically, but I've been doing this for now for five years. And nobody's really done it all more than five years. So that gives you an idea of, of how new this is. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's relatively new. Um, and I, I would say, like, what, the past, like, two or three years is when it's really gained some steam? Yeah. Yeah, between the, the celebs were really what changed it. Um, like, when rapper B.O.B., you know, did that song against Neil deGrasse Tyson, that was brilliant. Uh, when some of the athletes, Ky Kyrie Irving really, really helped us. Uh uh, Novak, uh, Djokovic, jo jo mm -hmm. oops, sorry, hang on. Um, Novak, uh, D Carl Frock, you know, guys, guys like that. I mean, so yeah, and and when any media group wants to take it on, you know, they usually make fun of it. Uh, it generates more publicity anyway. You know, when National Geographic called, just begged, it's like, oh, come down to Los Angeles with us and set up a set up a, a meetup just for us it's like okay i i guess let's do that and uh and it's in different countries which is even better i mean i did i did street activism over in um dublin and belfast last year uh it's i opened a con the what that's gotta be interesting yeah i was a little nervous you know because it's it's freaking ireland <laughs> It's like, do you really want to sit on a street corner with signs and people going flat earth? You know, might as well be wearing a sandwich board to say nothing crazy. Um, or I opened a, a conference in Stockholm and it wasn't even a flat earth conference, but the guy wanted to shake things up. And so he, he brought me in there to do that. And uh, yeah, it's been wild. Uh, yeah. Well, so, everybody has their everybody has their niche. And um I'm still not 100% convinced, to be honest you with know, you. You know what? I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade yeah. you. I'm just here to, to tell you, look, there's some some ideas out there. And you know what? I, I'll, I'll go the other way with you. Uh, usually I don't, I don't – this is not reverse psychology either. It's like, look, if you get up every day and everything's stable and thumbs up, you know, everything's awesome, don't look at it. Because once you go down I, – I said this at the beginning of the second book – I go, it, it literally is, I put in a, a like a multi-paragraph disclaimer, but the short version is, is there is a point of no return. Kind of like the matrixy red pill, blue pill. Because once you go in, if you're in, you can't go back out because you were the one that tore down the globe. So I, it's like, I'm not convincing you. It's like, you know, the, that it's not a globe. What happens is you, the t-shirt literally reads, I became a flat earther because I tried to debunk it. And if you tear it down yourself, well, then how can you build it back up? Hmm. And so, which is why our retention rate is so high. So don't, don't look at it. Just kind of look at it from the side. Just, don't dig into it. Even I, though I, I just sent you videos during this. I don't have the, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't have the time. And oh, good. <laughs> I don't have the time, number one. And number two, um, and, and nothing against you, but of yeah. the the list of things that I'm really worried about, if yeah. whether the, 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 the earth is a globe or not, yeah. is... Uh, not very concerning to me. I, I've got, I will agree with you on that point in that lately, as you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm much more, I'm more worried about government, tyr government tyranny. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as much as, uh, as much as I like talking about flat earth and I think the flat earth is a great eye opening, you know, awakening experience. Lately, it has been drowned out by <laughs> the utter madness that has been happening in the last few months. And I had I, it, every day, I mean, I'm, I check the news feeds basically every hour or two, all of them mm -hmm. simultaneously, just checking them just because the, the headlines change so quickly. And uh, yeah, 2020, I told people last year, I said 2020 feels like it's going to be a really, really weird year. And I had exceeded my expectations so far. So we'll have to see where it goes. I think it's exceeded everybody's expectations because nobody, I don't think, thought that uh, civil liberties would be eroded so rapidly. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I mean, I don't even know. I'm, I live in a rural island, right, up in the Northwest. I can't even imagine being in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York or, or Atlanta or places like that because it's just, it's just my, and, and most of it's voluntary. That's yeah. the part that 
that's the part that gets me. I mean, it's bizarre. I right? went to the I went to the store last week, and there were two out of three people wearing masks. And yesterday it was three out of four. And it's like, what is happening? Why? Why are you doing this? It's you're not even being forced to. Where I live in South Florida, it's a little bit different. And uh, like based on the county you're in, some some are more tyrannical than others. Yeah. And so Broward, which is south of me, yeah. is more strict. Yeah. Palm Beach, less strict. So you go to Broward, you have to wear a mask. So I, I just won't even go. Like if I'm there, I won't even. I, because it's not even far. Stop. It's not far from me, like as far as like a drive or whatever. So I yeah. go there. To, I mean, I have things to do there. So, but I won't go to a store. I'm like, I won't do. It. I'm like, I'm not gonna. The government can't tell me what to wear. What kind of bizarro land do we live in? Like, uh, absolutely. So, um, absolutely. And I'm not convinced of, of the lethality of this. And like, I don't. I don't feel like I'm at risk. And you shouldn't be. You shouldn't yeah. be. The number. I, look, I'm a stats whore. And yeah, they're, they're, the numbers, I said this in the beginning, I go, the stats are, do not match up. Yeah, no, 100% doesn't match up. So then, but then I go in uh, to like a store here in Palm Beach where I live, and like yeah. you see somebody else that's not wearing a mask. And it's like you get that look, you know, like, like you make eye contact and it's like you're like you're already in like some kind of a weird club. Like we have a, yeah. we have a bond, right? Like, oh, okay, we're not sheep. Got it. Yeah, and it's it's really bizarre to me, like the whole thing and and the, the the relative ease that people have just been like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I and I and I get it. I mean, even though I want to get mad at the sheep, it's tough because if all the news services are on the same page, what what alternative do they have? I mean, that's well, I you know what I I kind of disagree with that because I I get it. The the news is on a on on the you know. There's some kind of monopoly there. Yes. And, but if you don't have the wherewithal to think for yourself, right. Um, and to at least fact check them, yeah. you know, and, and the thing is, <clears throat> I think you have a pretty good argument. This with flat earth, like you, you have the same thing. Like, you know, you could just go fact, do your own research. Yeah. But, and that's a little more difficult, right? <laughs> to do the, the flat earth thing, but yeah. to look and just to look at the numbers and just look yeah. at the numbers. It's not that difficult. Like you can't do oh, yeah. mash. It's simple division to get the percentage of something. It's simple division. It's not, it's oh, yeah. not, you know, we're not talking about complex theories here. So yeah. just look at for yourself, you know, like the new one is we're like, Oh, the, the, the rates of infections are rising in, in some of these States that are opening up quote unquote. Right. Right. But, the Georgia thing. Yeah. yeah. But what they're not telling you is, is that that's because they're doing more, Anybody testing, and so the antibodies are coming back that they've had it, and then they're just lumping that in, and rightfully yeah. so with the number of confirmed cases. Yeah. But they're saying more confirmed cases, but they're not. It's not new active cases. They're just more confirmed cases, and those some of those confirmed cases could have been from two months ago. So, yeah. what are the what's the rate of new cases of people who actually currently are still infected by the virus, not yeah. inactive cases of people who had had it previously? And so, yeah. but the media is just deceptive. But nope. And if you don't look into it for yourself, like you know, then you yeah, you deserve what's coming to you. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, it. It, it bothers me. I, I, what I call it, it, luckily for us, at least in America, other countries not as lucky. Um, you know, there's so many people because we're all about money. We have a breakout. It's like, look, man, we're going to go broke. If, you know, that's, the, that's that driving force that people are like trying to go back to work. Uh, and what I call it is the, um, the no zombie scenario, which is the media could come out tomorrow, right now, and say uh, there's zombies. There's zombies here. There's zombies there. They're yeah. really dangerous. Be afraid of zombies. The problem is, unless you have, unless people start seeing zombies, they're going to be like, you know, eventually that that fear is going to wear off, and that's what's happened with with mm -hmm. us because you know it's like, hey, Fred, do you, you know, forget about zombies. Fred, do you know anyone that's died? No. Tom, do you know anyone that's died? No. Hey, and if they died, right, even you find the where person, it's like, oh, yeah, he died. Did he get struck down? Was he a healthy person? Then five days later, he was dead. Or did he already have lung cancer? Did he already have yeah. this? Did he already have that? And then, of course, you know, the social media yeah. has really undermined a lot of the, the fear wave that's come out. But still, it's pretty been pretty effective. Well, this is what I tell people all the time. I say, how many people do you know? And they'll be like, oh, like 20 or 30. I'm like, no, no, no. How many people do you have in your contact list in your cell phone? There you go. And they're like, oh, yo, you're right. Like a couple hundred. I'm like, yeah, okay. How many of those people died? And they're like, uh, none. Some of them say one, none. I'm like, okay, so yeah. the news is trying to tell you that there's a high casualty rate and millions of people are going to die. Yep. You don't know anybody. Yeah. You don't know anybody. 
or yeah. you know one person who, like you said, had diabetes and heart disease and like whatever, like a or myriad three, of three gunshot wounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah a, a bunch of other things. And I'm, I'm so I'm thinking about it, just use your common sense. Like common sense tells you that if all these people are supposedly dying, like where are they all at? Like where yeah. are they? You yeah, know? there was a there was um uh one of the the big trumpets for this on our side is a, a guy named Richie from Boston. And he's absolutely just driving around, just swearing that martial law is going to kick in any time. And he he was the big guy saying, "Look, if the rates were that serious, you would one of your family members would be dead, one of your cousins would be dead, the guy that works at the gas station, he's dead, your dentist assistant, she's dead. You know, you would run into you know everyone yeah. that's but." Since that's not happening, what, what do you expect? People are angry. It's like, oh, people are going to the beaches. It's like, because nobody knows anybody that's dead. Yeah. It's, the, the fear has to hit home, and it never did. And so when, so when people are talking about right now about that second wave BS, it's like the first wave didn't hit. What do you think the second wave? The second wave is not going to do anything because people are going, are you kidding? I didn't know anyone that died in the first time. So why should yeah. I listen to you this time? Uh, yeah. No, no. It's, it's, you're 100% right. It's crazy. Oh. And uh, well, we'll see what happens. We'll see yeah. what. Oh, there's a fly. Have you noticed this? It's been driving me crazy the whole time we've been recording. There's a fly in here, and it keeps. Was it really, really small? Yeah, I guess so. But he's he left now, but he's gonna come back. It's been <laughs> driving me insane the whole time. Anyway, anyway, thank you. Can I, can I get a? I, I don't know if we're we're still on air. Can I get an audio of this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I'm gonna real Post quick it. plug. However, where do you? Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Yeah, if you guys want to know what how what I'm doing again, don't look into flat Earth because it's really crazy. Uh, which just type in, um, go into YouTube, type in flat Earth Mark. That's the easiest way to find me. Uh, my books are called Flat Earth Clues. The video series is called Flat Earth Clues. I have two on Amazon. One's called Sky's Limit. The other is called um, uh, End of the World, which is interesting because that came out at the end of last year. And just because I ha I made one, my publisher said you might as well release it. I released a survival guide. <laughs> Uh, just a few like last month called uh, Empty Shelves, How to Organize Your Corner of an American Apocalypse. And uh, it's uh, it's basically literally uh, kind of a not necessarily tongue in cheek. It's got a lot of serious stuff in it, but it'll tell you, you know, if, if things get worse than now, uh, it'll tell you how to hang on, especially if you're in America. OK, perfect. yeah, I'm going to put the links to all that stuff in the description okay. so people can get to it quick. And thank cool. you again, Mark, for being on the show. And that's a wrap. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Slightly Sophisticated with Kyle Ramos. Please like, subscribe, and rate the show. And if you feel so inclined, leave a review of what you think about Kyle's level of sophistication. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time. I suppose some of us are slightly sophisticated. Just listen.